Good evening, folks. Uh, we're going to wait just a few seconds longer in case anybody else shows up. But I do want to uh, welcome everyone here. And I'm uh, glad y'all came and showed up. The uh, important thing for y'all to remember, of course, is that this is your archives. You own the state archives. This is your archives. We are here to serve you, and we want you to get all this information out of it. So uh, don't forget that. We are fortunate tonight to have uh, one of our local authors. Uh, George, wave your hand back there. George Hall, who spoke here only a month and a half ago. And uh, George has a book out that y'all should get hold of, and, and it's uh, in relation to uh, Civil War guerrilla. The, uh, especially the guerrilla theater of operations right in the middle of our state. So it's a very interesting book, and uh, uh, I would recommend it, and you might want to ask George about it back there if uh, you wish to afterwards. We're also very fortunate, and uh, Dr. Hatfield is right here with us. He's going to wave his hand. Dr. Philip Hatfield, I believe you're from North Carolina, are you not? Originally from Hurricane. Originally from Hurricane, where? where my grandfather's from. So I'm going to show his books off, and I want y'all to, to uh, look at them here in our library when you can get a chance to. Here they are. An interesting new book on the Hatfields, The Other Feud. And uh, it has all kinds of good stuff in it and some Civil War history about the uh, local, uh, I would say, operations of what, what you might call partisan rangers in the southern part of the state. Uh, I also have his new book, The Roman Rifle Guards, which is, uh, uh, looks very interesting to me. It's the, it's the history of Company K, 4th North Carolina State Troops. And uh, that is a hard fought regiment and it's uh, filled with uh, very interesting uh, personal letters, personal information. And it is, as he has just told me, you know, one of the few company Histories. You see a lot of regimental histories, but this is even more individual. It's a company history. So please check these out in your state archives. Okay? I think we're going to jump into this. Uh, Y'all have got, I think, your uh, packets. If anyone doesn't have one, I can give them one right now. I've got a few left up here. I think you do. The uh, subject uh, tonight is huge and complex. Uh, I usually know how to speak into these mics, but if you can't hear me, let me know, because uh, sometimes it's too loud or not loud enough. So I'm going to be speaking right into the mic. You know that this is a very large subject, a very difficult emotional subject. Uh, we are only going to be able to touch on uh, some basic facts and realities tonight. Uh, I have spoken, I think it was uh, oh, six months ago, eight months ago, uh, on Melungeons, and there may be some overlap in this subject matter. Uh, in discussing this topic, I wish to say right off the bat that I consider the slave states that were established in Virginia and all through the southern part of, the, of first, the colonies and then the United States of America to be a huge human disaster that led straight to our bloody civil war. This is not a subject that one can be very dispassionate about. So uh, you know that there is much controversy that we'll be going over tonight. It's uh, an indelicate subject, and uh, I can only say that we will do the best we can with it. And as most of you know, the southern slave colonies demanded and received an early acceptance of the entire system of slavery before they would ever even consider joining the new nation of the United States. I want to start here as just as an, as an entry uh, because it's a very interesting subject that a lot of Americans don't know very much about. Their constitutional convention and uh, the people that actually wrote the Constitution. Uh, these uh, concessions that they made to the slave states were made over strenuous objections 
of many of the delegates of our first Constitutional Convention. Many of these delegates pointed out that the American Revolution had been ostensibly fought for the rights of man, for equality and freedom, concepts that seemed to run diametrically opposed to the establishment of state-recognized slavery. But the southern states, controlled by a rich planter aristocracy, simply threatened to torpedo the entire new nation if their peculiar institution was not allowed. Vague notions of eventual abolition were hinted at, but never even fully discussed. And as the southern economy became more entwined with slavery over the next 50 years, even the public discussion of abolition was considered in many counties of the South a hanging offense. I open that just to, just to go back to the founding of our own nation. I just wanted to bring that up. Uh, I advise people to read the uh, interesting uh, Constitutional Convention debates uh, that very few folks have actually read. Uh, to begin, the first African people brought to the, our Virginia colony arrived in 1619 on a Dutch privateer. Some believed that these pirates had stolen the Africans from a Portuguese ship before bringing them to Jamestown. This Portuguese designation will further muddy the racial waters as time and mixed marriages produced a large population of biracial, and triracial Americans. Um, there are folks that have heard of mixed race people being called Portuguese, uh, and um, we all know the Melungeon histories. Uh, a lot of folks uh, have uh, grasped onto that Portuguese designation. I think this is where it might have all begun on that. But in the English colonies, the original labor system was one of indentured servitude, not slavery. It's important to realize. The uh, system uh, at, you know, had servants pay for their passage to the new world by contracting themselves out for a certain number of years, usually from seven to 20. With the addition of these 20 Africans, 17 males, three females, to the colonial labor force, a new racial mix was added to the burgeoning Virginia population. In these, de in these early days, the racial stigma of African was never as powerful and demeaning as it later was to become. Black servants worked right beside Irish, English, and Native Americans. Uh, as we all know, the Native population did not make very good slaves or servants and they uh, were often not even used to taking orders from their own chiefs. That's the type of person that our Native Americans were. Uh, the African people had a different tribal system and that did make a difference in their uh, differing views of slavery and servanthood. The, uh, the, the English tried to tried to get those Indians to stay. But you know, it's funny. They could run away. They lived here. <laughs> you know, it was a relatively easy thing for them to join the tribes as they moved further west to escape. Uh, African people, on the contrary, did not. They could not escape into the interior as easy as their fellow uh, Native Americans could. Uh, the, uh, the African tribal structure was also a little different, more used to taking, uh, I think, orders from a chief and a hierarchy. But the big change in the colonial economy was the skyrocketing price of tobacco. New lands had to be quickly cleared and a massive infusion of fresh labor was called for, especially when the uh, Native Americans obviously proved so unwilling don't know why they were so unwilling to help out, but uh, they didn't do very well. This demand occurred at the same time that the English merchants had taken over the Atlantic slave trade. And uh, the, uh, the demand for slaves had gone straight up. 
A large number of slaves were now landing in Virginia ports with no contractual project, you know, protections of any kind. The uh, indentured servitude was not applied to slaves. And uh, I now want to show you a few little interesting items that we have here in the library and that you should uh, take a look at if you get a chance. <clears throat> Here's an interesting map of where in Africa the slaves of Virginia came. And the different nations are listed and the percentages because the folks that did this recent book have proven to be very, very careful in their analysis. They've taken every ship's manifest. They've done an amazing job. This is an atlas of the transatlantic slave trade, and I recommend you all seeing that if you can. It's a good book. It has a lot of uh, facts and figures and maps. Our, uh, our bite of Biafra here and the Gulf Coast, uh, the, the Gold Coast here and Angola are our main areas. Angola, for instance, was a Portuguese colony. So I'm just stating that as a normal reality. Uh, that's a good book, and it will be here in the archives. Uh, it's it, it, interesting. Large number of slaves uh, were being brought in, and I heard on the radio a comment from an author. Another reason that there were so many slaves being brought in were, well, you know, was that the the dreaded disease malaria was infecting the entire southern Atlantic coast. Malaria was new and people were dying of it on a large scale. The Europeans brought in as indentured servants were dying to the tune of 40%, some only lasting a few months. Whereas the Africans had naturally been exposed to malaria before in Africa had been able to build up natural immunities and with the demise of many of our indentured servants you immediately see the raise of a demand for more slaves. They're healthier. They last longer. That's a very important point because it is also true that in Africa they had cattle and we all know how bad smallpox was in the New World. Native Americans had no cow, had never been exposed to cowpox before. Cowpox led many of the African people to immediately build up immunities, and that was a really good thing for them, except, of course, for the fact that they survived and were made even more important for slavery because they could withstand smallpox after having been exposed to cowpox. So you can clearly see the demand is going up because of their various immunities. Uh, the uh, uh, disease of both malaria and smallpox decimated our Native American population. I've shown this map so many times I think people are going to get tired of seeing it. But I think it needs to be shown because of the massive loss of human population uh, by the Native American people. Uh, it's a, a good one because it's from the Smithsonian. Y'all may have seen this before. Uh, we have two dates, 1491, 1650. Look at the number of tribal areas filled with Native American people in 1491 and look only to 1650. Jamestown, starting in 1619 era, only in that period of time, a massive death is happening all across the North America, the uh, North American uh, Eastern Seaboard of the continent. And the numbers are not known, but uh, some people think in the tune of millions were dying. I point that out because that made many of our Colonial areas open for more tobacco, eventually more cotton, obviously more rice to be grown. Uh, the Indian people were, uh, were dying and they were also retreating further west. Uh, over the years, uh, many of the 
African people who had served as indentured servants and that were brought in as slaves and might have been emancipated by their, uh, their owners, possibly emancipated. These folks were literally beginning to be freed that emancipation and the running out of their indentured servitude, seven to 20 years normally, left them with freedom. I know it's a difficult thing to say. You're in South Carolina, you work as an indentured servant. You're in Virginia, you work as an indentured servant. Once you had completed your indentured servitude, you're free. And you see how there is a new type of person that is coming to the forefront. There is uh, also the fact that many of these folks are mulatto, half black, half white, possibly Native American, white or black. It's important to really, to, you know, to realize that there were no laws against intermarriage, totally legal between African. Indian or white people until 1681. This is where we first encounter the term free people of color. Many of these newly freed people realized that with hard work and diligence they could own their own lands and business. And they proceeded to do so. But as the large plantation system began to buy up all the smaller farms and tobacco fields, a huge new slave population was growing right beside these free people of color and at a faster pace. I'm going to take you on another jaunt. Uh, we're going to take a little trip. You're in London. You're sitting in a coffee house where the coffee is naturally grown in Brazil. You're smoking your pipe of Virginia tobacco it's a very cold winter out there, and you're going to put on your beaver hat made in Canada, and you're going to put your coat on when you go outside from your beautiful leather coat from deer hide from Ohio. Can you see how the products, the basic products, are beginning to demand more production, more out of the new world? more colonial uh, mercantile interests. Uh, it is at this point that Virginia begins to embrace slavery as its future. It is here in the 1680s that the fatal decisions are made which set Virginia and the rest of the southern colonies on their economic path that is soon to be rejected by the rest of the, in quotes, civilized world. We will call them civilized it, as a as a name that we can you know use as as only a, a way to refer to various nations, I wouldn't call Russia or the empires of uh, the Balkans or Austro-Hungary as as civilized in many respects. But we'll call it that for right now. This civilized world was calling slavery inhumane, unchristian, and most importantly, inefficient for a modern capitalist viewpoint. As the slave system becomes all powerful, the example of the free people of color, those folks who are dark skinned, but who retain the same rights as white overlords, becomes quickly intolerable. How can a plantation owner tell their slaves that they can't leave the fields they can't learn how to read and write. They cannot even establish their own Christian churches. When, right beside them, there could be a freeman living with an Irish girl, running a blacksmith shop, and even serving in the county militia. You could quickly see how this situation is not going to be tenable the white population begins to realize that as they bring in larger numbers of slaves, the slave population is going straight up. The folks that are free people of color, whose fathers could have very easily been the plantation owners themselves, 
are now a dangerous commodity placed beside slavery, their situation becomes very interesting to the slave person who is looking across the road and seeing him live in his house and free. It's not going to happen. It's at this point that we can see how the white power structure begins to deal with this. One can see how this untenable situation, uh, especially when many of the counties are now having larger black populations than white populations. The smaller landowners that were white in the 1630s, 1640s, and 1650s have now been bought out by the larger plantation owners. Some of them may have gone back to England, but those large plantations are bringing in slaves constantly because of the vast amounts of profits made off tobacco. They want to grow as much tobacco as possible. We'll see, you know, we'll see later on that they, uh, they unfortunately burned the soil up. But, uh, this is when we see the passage of large amounts of black laws dealing with slaves and free people of color. This legislation becomes an avalanche of rules, penalties, taxes, and regulations, continuing right up to the death of Confederacy in 1865. These Virginia black laws vary in harshness and complexity, but are basically repeated throughout the South as a means to isolate, dominate, and terrify the slave population, and disenfranchise, manipulate, and eventually exile the free people of color. Let's take a look at these uh, these raw laws because I have them copied for you right here. They're done by a woman named June Purcell Guild. If you'll open your little thing up there, you'll see that I've got them right at the very front. No, it's on top. See the black laws? These are pretty interesting. This, they're, that, you know, they've been edited down, and uh, these, uh, there's more of them right up there. If, you, if anybody needs them, uh, these black laws need to be read. You need to read them over as you as you get a chance. We could pick a million of them out in different locations. You know, 1793, free Negroes or mulattoes shall be registered and numbered in a book to be kept by the town clerk which shall specify age, name, color, status, and by whom, and in what court emancipated. Annually, the Negro shall be, shall be delivered a copy for 25 cents. A penalty is fixed for employing a Negro without a certificate. <laughs> the Negro may be committed to jail. Every free Negro shall once in every three years obtain a new certificate. That's 1793. You can see that these laws become so intricate because every issue when you're dealing with slavery must be legislated. There are so many of these we could go on forever. Uh, some of them are a little brutal. 1853, clear up toward the start of the Civil War. The sum of $30,000 is appropriated for five years for the removal of free Negroes from the Commonwealth. The Colonization Board of Virginia is given power to act under this law. The annual tax of $1 is levied on every male free Negro of 21 years and under 55 years and collected as other taxes on free Negroes are collected. The fund arising from this source shall be applied to the removal of free Negroes. They're taxing the free Negroes to remove them from the state. The free Negroes are paying the taxes to have themselves exiled. I could go on. There is an incredible number of various laws. As I said, it was in 1681 when they passed the law that said you could not marry. White folks could not marry black folks or Indians, naturally. This had already been going on since 1619. So one can see that there's already a large black-white 
and Indian population that have mixed race antecedents. You can see that that is already happening all across Virginia. As one can see, the subject of slavery and its perfection as a social economic system seemed to be a continuous topic of Williamsburg and then Richmond. As the threat of a slave rebellion, as occurred in Haiti and elsewhere, became more worrisome, new laws of control and suppression are implemented. Even the reward of emancipation is held out to those slaves who would betray their fellows who were considering revolt. And after the infamous 1831 Nat Turner slave rebellion in Southampton County, Virginia, these laws also reinvigorated the old militia system, causing many counties to initiate troops of constables that would nightly patrol the Negro quarters. There is a list of such officers we have here from Montgomery County. There were even fines against those who were too lazy to go join the troops. They, they find them. It's right there in the black laws. Notice that uh, even, even during this period of time, often the counties across the mountains are being accepted. They do not have to follow some of these laws. They're trying to appease the folks across the mountains because they know they're not being fairly taxed for their slaves. And the folks across the mountains are catching on pretty fast. Naturally, there were far fewer slaves in the western counties of Virginia, and this population difference was to widen as the 1800s wore on. But from the start of these western counties, there grew an awareness that the taxation of property, which they paid in full, was not being paid by the slave owners, who paid only a portion of the value of their slaves. Over and over the Western delegates attempted to write this system in the state constitutional conventions. The Convention of 1829-1830 even discussed the eventual abolition of slavery over a specified period of time. And the famous Ruffner pamphlet shows how many leaders viewed slavery as a huge negative for Virginia. All these progressive ideas were shot down by the Tidewater aristocracy or watered down by the assembly into meaningless gestures to try to appease the western counties. In addition, the eastern part of the state was experiencing a great decline in its agricultural output because the continuous growing of tobacco had decimated the soil itself. They, once they were addicted to those profits from the tobacco, they couldn't stop. They kept growing it, even when people said, you know, if you keep growing the same crop in that field, it ain't going to produce. You know, that's exactly what happened all across the Tidewater. The soil itself was being depleted continuously. Uh, the rich plantations now made more money selling or renting their slaves to the far southern states than they did having their slaves actually working their fields. This happens all over many of the plantations of old Virginia. In our own Charleston newspapers, I have seen ads for, in quotes, slaves to be sold downriver. The folks in Virginia, not making money off their slaves doing agriculture, are now selling their slaves to the fast new sugarcane plantations in Louisiana and also the burgeoning Texas, my home, their cotton fields. My home state of Texas was opening up in the uh, 1840s and 1850s to huge new cotton plantations. Large demand. And uh, that's where the term comes from, being sold down the river. That's where it comes from. The western counties were not conducive to large plantation style agriculture. But there did arise one industry that utilized slaves extensively, the salt industry. It began along the Canal River uh, in the early 1800s, and by the 1820s it had grown very large, uh, even producing uh, America's first trust. I'm sure there's whole, whole books that have been written about this because it's a very interesting economic situation. They were the first trust 
produced in the United States to control the prices of salt. They decided who was going to get what and how much they were going to produce. That trust is an interesting story. Uh, Professor Staley's book is very good on that. Uh, slaves were essential for this industry. First, they chopped all the trees down naturally. Uh, you know, we always think our beautiful valley, you know, with all this gorgeous green. In the old days, there weren't any trees here. They had chopped them all down to burn for the salt. The salt is burned out of huge pans. These giant pans have to be fueled 24 hours a day. The salt brine being brought up out of the ground, out of the water, is evaporated continuously. When the trees were gone, the big salt producers figured out they could put coal down in there, and black folks, as slaves, became our first commercial miners here in, in West Virginia. Uh, that was a very difficult job, and these little mine shafts that they were going into were extremely dangerous. Uh, we can, uh, of course, go into that history a lot. We, we don't have time to do that, but it was a very hard work. It required the slaves to work four hours on and four hours off, 24 hours a day. You can imagine what kind of conditions those are. This industry survived uh, in a weaker condition clear up to the Civil War. By the 1850s, there were around 2,000 slaves in the Kanawha Valley working in the salt industry or as servants in the fine homes built by these salt uh, owners. This brings us to uh, an interesting counterpoint. All across the South, during slavery and after its abolition, one can find a vast amount of sentimental literature written about slavery in the old Southern culture, fostering this Southern culture, of course, was the sweat of these slaves. In these works, the reader strolls across the well-kept lawns and gardens of the great plantation houses and listens to the happy darkies. The darkies are strumming on their old banjos. The slaves are always content with their lot. And they're no longer being chased in, by, you know, through the jungle by the lions. No, they're eating their watermelons and basking in Christian charity. No doubt there were many happy homes like this. There were good, decent slave owners who cared for their property and saw this as a duty entrusted to them by a benevolent system for which they felt no shame at all. I'm uh, interested in this subject because around here locally, we have some very interesting stories. Many of the old Southerners that were in Greenbrier County, in Fayette County, up here in Kanawha County, uh, have written a, a bunch of interesting books in reference to their, their relationship with their slaves and to their agricultural time period of, uh, you know, before the war. I'm going to pull one up because it's a good one and I like it. Take a look at some of the uh, references uh, by the book here, uh, edited by Bill Wentz. Uh, Civil War Memories of Two Rebel Sisters. Very good book. Interesting interrelationships with their slaves. Constantly very personal, very kind, very generous. Always uh, in a very Christian manner. I can only say that this kind of literature is, is to be found everywhere, all across the South. And uh, much of it is very interesting to read. My only problem with it is that most of these fantasy, you know, these, this fantasy established uh, by many of these writers is one in a thousand. To bolster this fantasy, there were many free people of color who would defend slavery because they were already raised above it a notch and hoped to maintain this advantage by playing up to the masters not threaten their precarious bounds with violent actions like Nat Turner's. A lot of those folks know what happened to Nat Turner. After killing 65 white folks, 130 black people are hung, lynched, and everything else. It's, uh, it's not a pretty story. The uh, Nat Turner Rebellion can be studied, and we don't have time to go into it, but it created a fear that lasted clear into the 1930s. I'm just putting that out. That's my own opinion. This shows how the system of slavery 
held together by the threat of violence and equally fearful of eventual black reaction was always trapped in a delicate dance between the owner and his living property. It must be remembered that the free people of color did fit into a middle ground that often allowed them to be hired by the white elite to be overseers or craftspeople. They were often allowed to own slaves and then they could free them. It's a little problem, isn't it? Imagine being a slave who was emancipated. Your hard work, the master wants to emancipate you. Suddenly you are able now to buy your own wife and children. And that's not going to work, is it? What if you're a Quaker living in Pennsylvania and you're giving money to freedmen to buy slaves and free them? This quickly is changed in these black laws. They will no longer allow that. Quickly, they see that is not going to happen. No doubt, uh, they, they had a, a series of, of people that were free people of color that were, you know, buying slaves and perhaps even selling slaves. The free people of color are caught in between these two realities. They, too, were trying to survive. Uh, it must be remembered that uh, many slaves also began to be hired out as laborers. This is another area that people are just now studying because with the white masters, they began to realize that their soil is all burned up. They can't get much out of their fields. Why, I'll rent my slaves out and the slaves will pay me back a certain amount of money after they do their work. This is the situation in Kanawha Valley often. You'll see many of the slaves in Kanawha Valley are not owned by the salt workers. The salt owners that have the big salt factories do not own these people. They are rented from Old Virginia. They may be rented for two years. By then, many of them are worn out and they are sent back, beat up and no longer valued. I'm just pointing that out because this is a whole new area of an economic system that uses slaves to the benefit of their white masters. With the passage of the restrictive black laws, many free people of color began to filter west from the eastern counties and to cross the mountains. Uh, naturally, you know, we need to realize that they hope to reestablish themselves in areas like Wheeling, Parkersburg, Morgantown that did not have as restrictive laws. There was also the possibility for mulatto people to change their social status by passing for white in communities that did not know their family backgrounds. Many began to claim an Indian ancestry which may have been real or was simply advantageous to avoid the taint of slavery. In our West Virginia census records, right here on the computer and in our various files, census records are behind me, folks. There are literally families that you can follow from the 1850 census all the way to the 1930 census that change from black to mulatto to white. I have seen it happen. It's a very interesting process, and it is a subject that people uh, will avoid talking about a lot of times. The, the, the Virginia racial laws are so strict that you had to carefully manipulate these laws. And the census records are one of those ways we can find this happening. Uh, there's also an important history of Underground Railway here. Uh, the Underground Railway worked all across our state naturally escaped slave families moved across western Virginia going mainly up the river valleys like the Kanawha, Monongahela. They made their way to Ohio and Pennsylvania. Often Quakers gave helping hands to these escapees. But once you realize that after the passage of these black laws, all free people of color and all emancipated slaves were no longer allowed to remain in the state of Virginia. I don't know if people realize this. These laws now made free people of color a process of exile. 
they were going to go into exile. And uh, interestingly enough, there, there's even lists, and I'm going to show you these now. If you look in your, your little book, let's uh, take a look at the Monroe County of uh, this, going down past there. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to direct you all to the next next section. No, clear down here to the bottom. Let's, I'm, I'm trying to get her to do it so the rest of you all can. Go to Monroe County. Uh, no, it'll be down. It'll be, it'll be below you. Look, look below you here. No, no, in the other package. Right there. As you pull that up, you can see that we have lists of free people. These lists, and this one is listed as Monroe County 1822. A list of all free Negroes and mulattoes that are within the district of Samuel Clark, commissioner for the revenue within the county of Monroe for the year 100. Eight, you know, one, 1822 is the year. And uh, you can see that there are even descriptions of where they are placed. Males, females, infants. Uh, this listings, these listings are the kind of things that you will see in many of our counties. I've only seen a few. I think Montegale County, I've seen some. I'm not sure if our, deep in our archives, there may be more of these lists. These are the lists of free people of color, of, of color and mulattoes that are allowed to stay in Monroe County or will not get arrested if they're passing through Monroe County. You can see how over the mountains there could be a sheriff that could be very congenial. He knows Sam here. He's a good blacksmith. Why should he run him out of Monroe County? He wants Sam to stay there. He puts Sam on the list. Uh, in fact, there's even a blacksmith written down here, Alexander Thompson, at the very top of that list. These people were valuable for the community, but the laws stated that they had to be registered. Your next list goes clear to 1850 uh, when you see the next list for Monroe County. There you will even see how the coloration, which is always a large part of the black community when you have to deal with uh, the legal status of both mulattoes and free people of color. It is listed right there, a bright Negro, a dark Negro. Uh, these lists are, I think, are probably going to be in many counties. I, I don't know how many counties we have preserved these lists of, but uh, I think it's important to realize that uh, once uh, these people were on these lists, they could, they could possibly stay in the county or perhaps filter through the county. For instance, oh, in one year you have to leave. They could then, if they were free and uh, a free people of color, could go toward Ohio with actual legal status. Unfortunately, little information actually exists about our underground world you know, the Underground Railway in West Virginia because of a, its secret nature, which seems to have been maintained long after the Civil War for fear of possible reprisals in the era of Jim Crow. We do have some of this information, but not enough. I'm hoping that there will be young scholars that wish to take up this cudgel. It's a difficult uh, problem. There are, there are many stories that need to be compiled. Our history of the Underground Railway needs to be improved upon. So, though the western counties that became the new state in 1863 were union in, in sentiment, Lincoln and the U.S. Congress did not demand that the new state free its slaves until after the war. Most people do not know that about West Virginia. It was accepted into the United States as a slave state. And... Uh, they didn't want to alienate, you know, the folks who uh, did not believe in the abolition of slavery, but were still willing to remain loyal to the Union. This dichotomy is made even more pertinent when the men who created the new state were voted out of office as soon as the ex-Confederate soldiers were allowed to vote. After the war, African-American population in West Virginia drops as the open borders draw this population further north, leaving various small black communities around the state. 
uh, I could take you to these uh, books right over here, the census record books, and I'm sure that many of us have already done so, and see the drop of black population in counties like Putnam County, Kanawha County. 1860, 1870, 1880, 1900, the number of slaves begins to drop until the huge coal boom brings in lots of black folks from Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina. A lot of jobs open up in the, in the coal fields. That is where you see a resurgence of the black communities all across West Virginia. I'm sorry that we do not have time to go into this subject more. I, uh, I, I, I wish there was more time. Uh, I am of the opinion that Virginia's embrace with the slave system was a terrible economic mistake. It led to a human tragedy, a disaster with the consequences that we still deal with even today. I, I do not believe that there would have been a state of West Virginia if the support of slavery had not forced Virginia to secede from the United States. There would not have been a state of West Virginia. And if you look at the debates, there barely was. It was uh, right up to the end, it was very difficult even to get the folks that were pro-union to leave their old traditional ties with Virginia. Uh, there is so much more research to be done on this. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a lot of stuff here that in our uh, archives that really we've only compiled over the past 15 years. Uh, imagine how much African American history we still need to take in. And you and I have talked about this. We would like to have more oral histories. We would like to have histories of black folks that are getting old and beginning to need to tell their stories. I wish there was some way we could easily plan to have a giant oral history, you know, done. But we need to do so. The uh, the future is standing out before us. We hope that there are young people and young researchers and young scholars that will do this, uh, can build on uh, our lapses because we have gaps. Uh, we have more history on uh, black slavery in uh, Kanawha County than we have history from the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s on black folks. That is a gap, folks. And uh, I can only say we need to improve on that. The, uh, uh, you know, the, the fact that we, that we are still dealing with many of these questions is an entire subject we could go into for hours. We will not go there tonight. But uh, I want to thank you all for coming, and uh, naturally, I'll hope to be able to answer any questions possible. But before I end, I do want to say, Unlike myself, who is an interested student on this subject only, we have a wonderful expert coming October 4th at 6 p.m. here. Uh, it will be a Tuesday, I believe. Uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Phil Strum, who is going to discuss slavery in the Ohio and Kanawha River Valleys. We have our little leaflets here, and I can pass some of these out as y'all go. So remember that we are trying to bring this subject up as much as possible. I think it's an interesting area. And uh, we hope to do to do better on it. That should be an interesting discussion. So uh, come in here, uh, Dr. Strum. Uh, are there any questions out here in this on this subject, sir? Uh, I'm Anthony Kinzer, I'm director of the West Virginia Center for African American Culture in Charleston. And as a matter of fact, Greg, I have started a oral history project. Good called Your Voice in History, uh -huh. and uh, it began about a couple weeks ago. There have been ads running on the WCHS and WKZ, and the Garnet High School Union is, is this weekend. Good. Um, I have approached some of the former students of that school, and they were agreed to be interviewed. And over the course of the next several months, I have scheduled other Anthony's uh, discussing Garnett High School, our black high school here in Charleston, and uh, 
Do you have any cards or any addresses folks could get from you? Do you have a card or anything people could get? So yes, they could. Cards. Good. And there are some citizens around Charleston as well who agreed to be in it as well. Good. Talk about their personal history around Charleston and where they came from to Charleston and have lived here for 80 to 90, 80 to 90 years. And as a matter of fact, I have one scheduled in a couple of weeks so late who is 80, 85 years old who can give a great detailed history of about the blacks who lived over across the river. Huh. So over the next year or two, I continue to provide lots of oral histories about the black history of Charleston and about uh, their coming to Charleston in the state of West Virginia. Well, you may wish to put some literature out here, too, to tell folks about that. And uh, that's the kind of stuff I am talking about, Anthony, and I admire you for it. Thanks. I really do. Any other questions? Uh, surely there's somebody. How are you doing, Greg? I'm Cicero Fain. Uh, we met some time ago when I was yes, doing research. I remember. Um, I just wanted to say thanks for doing this, number one. And um, I'm, I'm going to shift the lens a little bit because I, I just recently completed my dissertation on uh, Cabell County. Uh, since I did um, black people from 1871 to 1929, but concentrating on uh, Cabell County and the uh, black migration affiliated with the railroad. And so my dissertation can be found, uh, if you just put in my name, Cicero Fain, F-A-I-N, at the Ohio State website. And I think it will add uh, layers to your discussion, um, because I do talk about many of the things you discussed, but it will also give a counterpoint, a comparison to the black experience, uh, slave and free black experience in Cabell County versus that of Kanawha County. Cabell County being much more uh, rural um, and agricultural um, as opposed to what you had here with the salt mines. And so, you know, I do discuss uh, Underground Railroad, I do discuss black coal, I do discuss uh, this, this transformation of the black experience. And most importantly, I discuss black agency. And how black people, even under the, you know, the, the uh, yoke of slavery were able to carve out niches of autonomy um, and, and um, uh, empowerment uh, underneath the system. So uh, I'll be happy to, to talk yes. about that. And we, we need a copy of I know. I just have to say that. You, need to, you need to give us a copy here yeah. from the archives so other folks can read it. Most definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. And, uh, and online, you say it's on the Ohio State? Yes. Race, uh, race uh, River, and the Railroads. Railroad. Race, race river, river, and the Railroad. railroad. Yes. I like the title. It's catchy. Yeah. It sounds good. Uh, and I can talk to you about yeah, that. Most definitely. So. Most definitely. Any other questions? Uh, anybody have a, a question? Uh -huh. Yes, sir. All of the southern states and the uh, many of the border states have laws to define who is black. I've never been able to find what West Virginia has such a law. The only thing I've been told by other lawyers is that West Virginia tended to take on the same law that Virginia had. But do you know whether there was a law to define who was black? That's interesting. But of course, because of course, right here we do have the black laws of Virginia. I do not know what yeah. is in the West Virginia. Virginia you know, is several over time. Uh -huh. I don't, I don't oh, they even decide that they even define it right after the Civil War. And uh, you're referring to racial purity, right? And I would think it would have changed over time too. There could have been some changes. That's interesting, and I am not sure that they ever did. I think they may have just stuck their head in the sand like they did about many other topics. But that's interesting, though, because we could look for that in our state constitution. It had to be a law of the state constitution, you see. And uh, I'm not sure about that. Is there any other people here that know the answer to that question? The same problem exists for Native Americans, as you can see. Uh, I can only say it's interesting, and I'll tell you this, we have uh, access to the computers back here that can pull up very quickly all of the black folks in the 1870, 1880, 1900 census. They can show who was listed on the census as black, which I think is interesting. But your question is about the actual official laws, and I'm not sure. Sir. Uh, 
one of my high school classmates, a man named Henry Burr, uh, who I hope you've all heard of, has done a lot of work on the underground history of the Underground Railroad. His ancestors came to, went to Ohio on the Underground Railroad. Uh, he has a website. If you look up under Google or in his search engines, Underground Railroad, Henry Burr, you'll find his material there. That's the gentleman that works at WVU, right? Is, is that the same guy or different guy? And that could be interesting, huh? Yeah. He's done some research that now, now is online. Huh? Yeah, and uh, he, he does presentations. There's an underground railroad center in Cincinnati, and there's one in Belfry, Ohio, which is just right across the river from Parkersburg. Huh. Yes, sir. Beverly, Beverly Gray out of Chilcott, Ohio, also has a uh, website. And on her website, she has uh, part of it ties in with Henry Burke and Leroy or Lester, I'm not, I can't remember right now. Uh -huh. Anyway, uh, she has a lot of information on the Underground Railroad, huh. of which my family was part of. That situation, like I say, is uh, you can imagine how folks after the Civil War didn't want to talk about it then either. Mm -hmm. And uh, those secrets went, went secret, stayed secret. I think some of those places did. But uh, the situation, and I couldn't go into all of the, the more recent racial laws from the 18, literally 1880s all the way to the 1940s. You, we all realize that there is a series of Jim Crow laws that once again suppress the black minority. And, uh, there's a whole, I could go in for hours on that one. And I, I, but I, I want to answer that question that you asked about the uh, official status. I do. Any other questions back here? Yes, ma'am. I unfortunately did not get to hear your lecture about the grungers. Uh, and it's something I'm very interested in. So if you could give me just a jumping off website or... Where, where to start? I actually can copy some stuff for you here, and oh, yeah. we can uh, we can talk about that. I've, I've taken stuff offline myself, and I've also been to the Melungeon Conference. When we had one down in Logan County, and uh, we, we do have some information now about Melungeons and several books. So Melungeon people are mixed-race folks, but there are two ways to look at it, and one is the general Melungeon, which is probably tri-racial, Indian, white, black. There's also the very uh, detailed Melungeon families that live in the area of uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, and West Virginia area. Right down in, uh, not Clark County, Tennessee, and several other areas right in the bottom of the state of Virginia. That is a specifically Melungeon area. That's that's two ways to look at that, in a general term, mixed race general term, or in a very specific Melungeon family term, which I can talk to you about. Thank you, I appreciate it. It's a very interesting subject. Great, they do have a website. Good. She Googles Melungeon, they Yes, you'll get all kinds of stuff now. You <laughs> will. All kinds. Anyone else? We haven't gone as long as we could have. But uh, I think we've gone enough. <laughs> uh, I appreciate y'all coming, and I do want y'all to come to our others. And y'all realize that we have uh, we have so much stuff here to look at. I think that a lot of folks don't realize they do not need to go to county courthouses. We have births, deaths, deeds, wills, marriages, and census records right here at your fingertips. It's only 25 cents a copy. Our online status with our uh, West Virginia State Archives uh, website, very good to look up births, deaths, and marriage records. Uh, we have a small state with a small population that gives us a chance to put a whole bunch of our stuff online, so please consider that. Uh, you've used it repeatedly, I know, and people need to realize that they can find births, deaths, and marriages in their own home at the tip of their fingers, just right there. So I can even show you later on if somebody wants to look at the website. So thanks a lot, folks.
I have extra extra pamphlets up here, two extra folders.